Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us um, and uh, bear with us while we get our, our bearings straight in kind of this uh, new format of having these important discussions to talk about collaboration and uh, digital storytelling. Uh, so first, my name is Amy Bacco. Thanks for joining us again. This is the third um, event in our series, Capturing Community, uh, Digital Storytelling and Community Driven Archives. Um, today, I am very pleased to um, be uh, hosting, we're hosting um, Mark Crane, the Executive Director of Dream of Detroit, and his colleague, uh, my colleague too, Dr. Lisa Perkins, uh, here from Western, to talk about uh, a project that they have been working on. Um, the Detroit Muslim Storytelling Project is an oral history initiative that was launched in 2020 by the Neighborhood Revitalization Association, uh, Dream of Detroit. The project is guided by the principles of community-based participatory research. Um, and I think you will see as we go through this presentation um, that there are uh, many people that have lent their expertise and their voices. Uh, and I think many of them are here today. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mark Crane. Uh, he is, as I said, the executive director of Dream of the Detroit, a Muslim-led community-based neighborhood renewal organization, also known as DREAM. Uh, prior to joining G Dream of Detroit, Crane served as uh, communications and outreach coordinator for the Inner City Muslim Action Network of Chicago. Um, and additionally, for a decade, he has been playing a dynamic role in MoveOn.org, where he served as campaign director, mobile innovation director, and chief of member experience, consulting on political and campaign strategy for highest priority initi uh, initiatives. So thank you for joining us to Mar uh, today, Mark. Um, if you would like to get things started and um, you know, kind of introduce us to Dream of Detroit and uh, sure. you take us away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and thank you to, to uh, Dr. Perkins and to, to Western for hosting this conversation. Um, uh, Professor Bate as well. Um, so, you know, my goal today is really just to um, give you all a, an introduction to Dream and to our work. Uh, to give you some context for, for the Detroit Muslim Storytelling Project um, and to allow Dr. Perkins to really go in, in depth with what we've been working on over the last um, more than a year at this point, but you know, it's pandemic time, so I can't even tell you how long it's been right now. <laughs> um, so let me tell you a bit about DREAM. We started in 2013, uh, and as Amy mentioned, that for a long time I was working with uh, the group MoveOn.org, and, and DREAM was this labor of love for a lot of people. Um, over the years, we've had over 500 volunteers. We've got a really um, solid, committed core of board members and steering committee members. I mean, it's really just recently that I've actually stepped into this role as, as the executive director full time, which I'm really grateful for. Um, so for all of these years, all the work that I'm going to share with you was really just done by, uh, you know, a ragtag group of volunteers who are really committed to this vision. Um, so Dream, we like to say that we're combining community organizing uh, with community development, that is housing and land development to revitalize our neighborhood here on the west side of Detroit uh, and to facilitate building a healthy community. Um, and so again, we started around 2013 um, and our work has really settled into sort of three main areas to date. That is uh, housing development. Uh, we rehab nearly 15 homes in our neighborhood. Um, economic development, as we try to envision what would it look like to really bring life back to the sort of main street uh, economic corridor in, in our neighborhood that was once you know, really brimming with businesses. Uh, and then thirdly, community organizing. Um, so how do we go beyond just raising tens and at this point, hundreds of thousands of dollars to rehab homes, but really move our community into the conversation around um, what were the systemic issues that made Detroit's neighborhoods look the way that they do? Um, and so one of our uh, most salient campaigns that we've been involved in is the uh, Coalition for Property Tax Justice, which is really trying to address the fact that in the city of Detroit, uh, starting around 2011 and stretching well into the latter part of the decade, um, the vast majority of residents, and especially low-income residents, were being overassessed on their property taxes. And when you look at the way that Detroit's uh, neighborhoods have really hollowed out over the last decade or decade and a half, uh, in fact, Wayne County, the, the county seat of Detroit, has been sort of one of the biggest purveyors of light in, in the city. 
uh, foreclosing on one in four homes between 2011 and 2015. So um, we believe that not only should we be involved in the neighborhood development work, but really that we've got to be in these conversations around, again, solving the systemic issues uh, and seeking compensation for folks who, who were harmed, um, you know, uh, by these systems. Um, so when we talk about what we've done in the neighborhood, I mentioned, you know, we've rehabbed uh, just under 15 homes now. We're actually working on 13 and 14 simultaneously right now. Um, and it's been a mixture of uh, families moving into the neighborhood as well as uh, some programmatic homes, if you will. We run a, a, a transitional home for previously incarcerated men. It's called Project Homecoming. Um, uh, so we're now entering kind of our second year with the home being open. Uh, we also run an, uh, uh, an artist residency it's called Indus Detroit. Uh, it's, we, we rehab the home and the residency is located in. Um, so in addition to moving families in, new homeowners, some renters, um, we've also got these, these programmatic spaces that are helping us bring new life to the neighborhood. Uh, over the long term, we hope that our housing work is really um, um, a, a tool for preserving the, the rest of the homes that are in the neighborhood, uh, particularly you know, um, uh, giving dignity to the neighborhood for those folks who've lived here for 60 or 70 years. Um, but also that our housing work helps to preclude, um, uh, you know, that sort of ever-present threat of gentrification in neighborhoods like this. And so we're hoping to set up a community land trust and to really put some some um, programs in place that help us make sure that this neighborhood uh, not only has a future with new development, but also affordable development well into the future. Um, uh, on the economic development front, our work has been um, a little bit slower. You know, we, we said that we would really move into that as we hit a tipping point with the housing work. But we've graduated about 60 folks from our entrepreneurship training course, which we host. Uh, it's called Prosperous Detroit. Uh, we've also brought out thousands of folks to our our, um, our street fair, our annual street fair prior to COVID, uh, which was really this, this uh, effort to bring a lot of people out, bring life to Woodrow Wilson Street, which is the name of the main street here, um, and really get people to think about what would this area look like again if it were walkable, if it were lined with businesses, if people came here for commerce and for community. Um, and over the years, you know, our work has been, um, you know, it's 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 received some some good coverage. Uh, we've had articles in the Detroit Free Press, uh, Cranes Detroit Magazine, um, as well as the Nation. Uh, we had a piece run in the Nation maybe four years ago uh, that asked, you know, uh, can this can this Muslim community provide a blueprint for revitalizing Detroit? Um, it was a big question that we're still trying to answer. Um, but, uh, you know, th that is to say that, you know, we're grateful that folks have sort of taken notice of what we're trying to do here, because the reality is that when we started this work, uh, our neighborhood was one that had been completely written off. Uh, if you go back and look at the 50 year strategic land use framework for the city of Detroit that was released in 2012, uh, our neighborhood was labeled an ecological innovation zone. You know, they said the population would never return and that over time, you know, city services would be cut. And, We'd have shallow pools to collect rainwater and take pressure off the sewage system and uh, something they call controlled overgrowth of vacant lots, and, you know, oxymoronic sort of term. So um, this was an area that, you know, folks didn't, uh, at least let's say the planners didn't see a, a, a real future for, um, but our community members did. And so that's what we've been working toward is that future. Um, so to pivot into, into this particular project that we're gonna talk about tonight, um, you know, I, I'm sitting here with a, poster behind me of Malcolm X, and it actually, just by happenstance, we found this poster here at the Muslim Center where Dream's office is, um, but it's got one of my favorite quotes from, from Malcolm on it, where he says, um, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. And um, when we talk about the particular um, Detroit Muslim community that we've been collecting a lot of stories from, I mean, this really is a historic community. Uh, this community dates back to one of the earliest um, uh, black Muslim communities in the nation with the Nation of Islam. The Muslim Center um, grows directly out of that trajectory of the original temple number one of the Nation of Islam, which was founded in, uh, in Paradise Valley uh, over in Black Bottom in, in Detroit, um, and then moved to the West Side uh, as Masjid Wali Muhammad in the 1970s. And, um, and then the Muslim Center grows out of Masjid Wali Muhammad. So we're connected to a really rich legacy uh, that has you know, just tons of incredible stories you know, worth preserving. Um, but also, as we're building toward the future, we know that there can't be a disconnect between us and the generations who've come before. Uh, we have to honor their stories. We have to know their stories. We have to share and propagate their stories. Um, and so this project is, is an effort to, to do that. Um, you know, uh, as I start to 
sort of hand the mic over to Dr. Perkins, I'll say that, um, you know, we really, uh, you know, this, this project grew out of a seed of an idea um, uh, that, you know, Dr. Perkins has, has really watered into this wonderful tree of a, of a project. And, and, you know, as she goes through the slides, you'll, you'll get a chance to see the, the breadth of the project and, you know, the number of, of folks who've been involved and various aspects of it. Uh, you know, but we really, you know, we started out wanting to collect, you know, 30 interviews on some iPhones and make a short documentary and it's grown into, you know, just this incredible archival project that we're really, you know, proud to be a part of and proud to produce. So uh, thank you again for, for welcoming us to share about it tonight um, uh, and really eager to, to see you all get to learn more about the project from Dr. Perkins. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um... So why don't we, uh, we can kind of move to the uh, next, um, we'll, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Perkins, but also if anybody has questions, um, you know, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we can do, uh, we can always chat at the end also, um, and we can move you into being a panelist if you would like to have a discussion. So uh, moving uh, on to uh, our, our next, uh, presenter here today uh, to build off of um, the work that Mark has and community and uh, that Mark's just uh, showcased for us uh, is Dr. Lisa Perkins. Uh, Dr. Perkins is an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Religion at Western Michigan University. Uh, as an anthropologist, Perkins ongoing research is eth an ethnographic study of Muslim American civic engagement in the Detroit metro area. Uh, she's also a, a colleague from the Center for the Humanities, so I want to also say thank you for, um, you know, sharing your project with us tonight. So, Elisa, I will hand the mic over to you. Thank you so much, um, Amy, for that beautiful introduction. And um, I'm really honored to be part of the Capturing Community series. Um, I know that it came together kind of quickly and that you know, Amy and Scott were at the, you know, the front uh, front ground of uh, getting together this series very quickly. And I think it's just come together beautifully and I, I'm so happy to be part of it. And I'm so happy that, um, you know, Mark is visiting Western Michigan University, even though it's virtually, we hope next time it will be in person um, because I think, you know, it, it would just be wonderful to, uh, to keep um, having uh, Mark and, and others from the project come um, and, you know, uh, join our uh, Western Michigan University community. Um, so the Detroit Muslim Storytelling Project, otherwise known as the, you know, Dream Storytelling Project, well, the aim, as, as Mark said, was is to increase public knowledge about African American Muslim community building in Detroit historically and today. And the focus is on creating and disseminating outputs that are publicly accessible and geared towards wide audiences. And so with every step that we do in our project, it always has to have um, with, with an eye towards how is this translatable? How can we make this um, not just something that's gonna sit in a book? And books are very valuable and important. I will defend them to the, <laughs> to the last moment, but um, there's also other kinds of you know, publicly engaged humanities work that's fortunately been gaining more recognition in um, especially in the digital age. And so we wanna be part of that. Um, it's important, you know, so tell, increasing public knowledge about African American Muslim community building in Detroit. Detroit um, is, as, as, as Mark said, it has a singular importance to African American Muslim history nationwide and even, you know, internationally is uh, international importance, knowing that, um, you know, movements, uh, pan-Africanist movements and all kinds of um, large intellectual and social movements, you can trace back to, um, to Detroit. And so, um, it's uh, the origin point of the Nation of Islam, the birthplace of uh, Warthin Muhammad, who was born in Hamtramck, which is just in the Detroit metro area. There are strong, enduring African-American Muslim institutions, and there's also um, very exciting forms of cooperation with African-born Muslim immigrants um, as their numbers increase, um, and a lot of very exciting things going on today uh, regarding civic engagement. Um, 
So what is civic engagement? Um, it's an abstract term, civic engagement, community building. These are abstract terms and it's wonderful to have kind of a cipher term to work with an abstract term because we can fill it and define it however we want to. And so using such an open ended concept, you know, normally when people think of civic engagement, maybe they'll think of someone, you know, running for city council or, you know, opening up, um, you know, a social service organization or, uh, you know, getting out the vote, but there's other forms of civic engagement too, um, such as as, you know, uh, volunteering at a soup kitchen or, you know, opening a business that represents the need of underserved uh, populations or even being that person in the neighborhood whose house is always welcome for everyone. You know, that's a form of civic engagement too. And especially when you come to women's forms of civic engagement and the civic engagement of religious organizations, because they blend the public and the private in unique ways. Um, you know, it really, you know, as we study public engagement from these different ways, then, then we learn from the people doing it, how to redefine. And that's what is interesting about the project. Um, what we're doing is, um, you know, creating knowledge that's based mainly on video recorded oral history interviews with African American Muslim community leaders and their close associates and also collecting documentary footage. And along the way in this self, very highly re, self reflective knowledge building project, the process is always as important as the product. So, making sure that the project's leadership and creative team is comprised of, is comprised of members of the community that's being represented. Um, and so we also have, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment when we get to the method slide. We want to represent women and men equally, but, and to include both African American and African born Muslims and people who are interfaith, um, you know, kinds of partners or people who are crossing ethnic lines and also being part of the Muslim community, the larger Muslim community. Especially at first, we wanted real emphasis on the pioneers, meaning those um, people like who are historically perhaps the first in their families to take Shahada or also the people who have really built uh, new traditions. So we kind of call them the pioneers. Um, and um, Dream of Detroit's work, recognizing, as Mark said, that Dream of Detroit, we could call it African-American Muslim led civic engagement, um, recognizes very much in its literatures and the way, it, you know, the organization speaks of itself as grounded in the legacies of past and current social wider social justice efforts. So, you know, what, and working on the project, I sort of see Dream of Detroit as this uh, almost like our nucleus, our focus point, and then being surrounded by all these concentric circles and intersecting lines and like, you know, it's like, but we're really, you know, wanting to seek to represent Dream of Detroit as situated within the network. And so the, this larger context. And so we do sometimes we do really want to represent people involved in Dream of Detroit, but also all of the people who have influenced them and who work with them. And that's really nicely um, shown on this picture, which is from that nation article published in 20, 2017 that Mark earlier referred to, which, um, you know, does depict some of Dream of Detroit's main leaders. You might recognize even somebody from, <laughs> from the picture. And um, so you see there's ethnic diversity represented, racial diversity, age diversity, gender diversity. And so um, we want to, um, in our project, we want to, you know, continue with that kind of representation. Um, the method of the project is something that I'm very excited about as being trained as an ethnographer and anthropologist, knowing that there's other ways to go other than just being like the single, like, you know, author of your project. I mean, when you're an anthropologist or an ethnographer, you know that you're completely indebted to the people that give you information. They're your teachers, you know, some people call them participants or informants, but it's actually much more precise to call it your teacher. You go into a, um, you know, community and you want to learn about that community and the people who teach you about that community are your teachers. And so um, recognizing that um, it, you know, and, and doing that kind of project and then coming out with like my first work, which was a single authored book, I, you know, there were some frustrations in it um, and wanting in the future, knowing that my next project, I really wanted to do community based research. I wanted to partner with people from start to finish on a project. And so it would be a shared uh, knowledge building venture. Um, and it has, you know, just as I suspected, it has been incredibly fulfilling and, um, and, and much more enriching, you know, very enriching. Um, it's a method, you know, as uh, all we have many methods and as the, in this method is something I'm particularly excited about also because it's kind of a newer approach and I don't think it's really been exhausted yet. Like we're still formulating what it means. And so the basic 
crumb of it, the basic uh, seed is that the people most affected by an issue are the people who know most about that issue by definition. And so if we're looking at the issue of how to create community in Detroit and how to and how African American Muslims are creating community, then obviously the people most affected by the community making activities of the, of African American Muslims should be at the at the helm of knowledge production to whatever degree possible. And so um how do you do this? Um you know, um we um we 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 built a team, you know. That's the first thing we did. We uh as soon as uh, the project was funded by the Pillars Fund, the first thing we did was build a team of people um who who identified as African American Muslims who were engaged in the community, including filmmakers, media experts, also people who were just consultants to the project who were able to tell us about, you know, who to include and how to um frame what we're thinking about. And then perhaps most um in a way, most importantly, the young people who identify as part of African American Muslim community who served as our community based ethnographers. And you see two of them here um, Naima Sadiq and uh, Mumina Ahmad, who um, were two of our, are two of our most active ethnographers, community based ethnographers. And you also see Alexis Collis, who is a Wayne State University um, student in journalism and broadcasting, who was um, actually after doing a small internship, then became a sort of production assistant. She really shown in the project as did um, our community ethnographers, uh, Naima uh, and Mumina. And so, um, you know, our core team, um, we had between ages of 15 and 20, we had nine young people in all from the community who are um, seven of them are ongoing, have done multiple, multiple um, interviews. And so we've already collected 50 re video recorded oral history interviews since we started via Zoom and live. Obviously, being part of the pandemic, you know, it changed a little bit. It made us a little bit more um, willing to do things over Zoom. And the young people are involved in many parts of the process, including selecting the storytellers, conducting background research and writing the interviews, carrying out the interviews, video recording the interviews, facilitating the interviews. They receive training for this and then ongoing training, and then they kind of train each other as well. Um, you see, like, here's a typical, you know, day where we were shooting an interview. Um, I'm in Kalamazoo. I have not been going back and forth in Detroit, so I've been playing a um, coordinating role. And so you see a typical day would be, uh, you know, one of our young ethnographers here, it's Naima, um, taking care of video, getting ready for the person to come. And Mumina, you know, she'll be carrying out the interview. So she has, you know, the questions that, you know, we've worked on together. And, um, and then there'll be another person facilitating. And then we'll have um, Malika Shabazz is our supervising producer um who is a media expert film and media expert and also uh the director of our forthcoming documentary so you'd have maybe a team of five people the team will shift depending on you know which ethnographers are available and then the you know the person who's being interviewed will come in and um do a 90 minute interview sometimes it's two hours sometimes a little bit less or more than 90 minutes you know and um so basically, one thing that we learned from this is interviewing is an art. It's a collaborative process. So if I work together with the um, the community based ethnographers, you know, to research and write an interview, and then we write up like an interview protocol during the interview itself, as anyone who's ever conducted an interview will tell you, it's going to change a lot, like how the questions are posed and the order in which they're posed and the emphasis that's placed on things and the follow up questions are very essentially important. So it, it, like carrying out an interview is much more than reading a list of questions. And so our community based ethnographers, I've like watched them grow and I've seen them in action um, on the video. They have really shown like they have learned and they have already came in with talents as well to do these interviews. They have background knowledge about the community. A lot of the times they're interviewing family members or friends of family, and it adds a very warm um, and productive wonderful um feeling to the interview um and hopefully when you guys like look into the archive you'll see it yourself and so we have um four main outputs and they are the um you know the archive and the, when the archive is gonna um, hopefully keep on growing right now we have 30 interviews saved and hopefully we'll we have 20 more to put in and we'll hopefully keep carrying more and more out then from there we're gonna have um hopefully we'll have this website it will contain little clips or gems from the interviews organized in a very digestible way. 
um, and also, you know, complete with um, contextualizing information, um, the documentary film, which is in process and um, the publications, the documentary film. Um, so, whereas we're taking a very wide um, view on African American Muslim based community development in Detroit on our archive and website, the film takes a narrower focus as films need to, and is going to focus more narrowly on how is this tradition of uh, leadership and community building being played out in the neighborhood around the Muslim Center, which is the neighborhood of Dream of Detroit. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty small neighborhood, you know, and, um, and it has uh, the Muslim Center, Mosque and Community Center as an anchor. It has a very large church, the AME, um, you know, church, the Greater Klan AME Church. It has, um, you know, other um, organizations that are affiliated with um, the Muslim Center, such as the Huda Clinic, which is a free medical clinic, which came out of the Muslim Center. It has a garden. It has other, pro it has other projects and programs. And so we want um, the film to, you know, enriched and informed by all these interviews, you know, the film will really bring to life um, the film provisionally titled The Block Club and the Mosque will tell that story. And what I'd like to do is show you a little bit of the, um, the, the something towards the film, which actually we piece together little clips from interviews from the oral history interviews and some footage that was taken by interns or Wayne State interns took the footage. And we pieced it together because one of our grant applications asked for a work sample and um, I, I was happy with the results. So I want to play you this about 2 minute clip and it's going to show you the, it's not going to show you the people doing the interviews, but you can see they're all talking to our young people as they talk and you'll see the neighborhood. You'll see inside the Muslim center and you'll see some of the community building work that we're talking about. So I like to play it. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is another picture of the interviews process. We have um, sisters Aisha and Samaya Cook carrying out an interview with um, Rafiq Mahdi, and this is in the Muslim Center itself, um, and uh, taken by our community-based um, photographer Tasneem Joseph. Um, and now um, our outputs, like I mentioned, uh, the archive, the website, uh, the documentary film, and the publications are going to be our outputs. And now I will show you that uh, work sample and uh, it'll be about two minutes long. And um, okay. It was a neighborhood. It was an African-American neighborhood. And when I say neighborhood, I want to put emphasis on the neighbor, not just a hood, a neighborhood. I think back to that and I think to what we have now. It's a big difference. Around the neighborhood of the Muslim Center, there are a number of properties that have been abandoned. pretty much deserted. We just want a safe, secure neighborhood, and we want to be neighborly. I believe that there's a much more of a desire now to work to bring it back to the way that it should be. just naturally feeds into that. Dream Detroit is focused on creating a stronger neighborhood and helping people keep their homes. We're trying to build a Muslim community here. Longfellow Block Club, we just get together and we make stuff happen. The place I feel most comfortable, the most familiar with, the most at home, the most welcomed, is here at the Muslim Center. You get this sense of family, of connectedness. Yep, dream! We need people to come and join us. So, you know, if you're African American and you're looking for a place to be, this is a good place to be. Um, 
So that was um, our first um, video piece we put together. And since then, we've done a more intensive um, video pitch for our project that hopefully um, you guys can, you know, we'll put it up in the archive too. And um, I guess um, this is our archive that also um, Amy's gonna talk more about. And again, we have this picture of, um, we, oh, sorry, the pioneers. Um, this was provided by uh, historic Masjid Wali Muhammad. This is a picture from the 70s of um, Detroit-based, um, you know, African-American Muslims who have been active in the community. And um, so on the archive, we have our, just, uh, this is a scholar works uh, production that Amy's gonna tell you a little bit more about the logistics of how, you know, um, we ended up working together to create um, this video archive. And um, our landing page gives you a sense of all the different people who were involved and it just goes on and on and we'll keep adding more names here too. You can see like our core team, our community ethnographers, our university based interns, it's more than 50 people who've pitched in just on this project. Um, we're funded, it shows that we're funded by grants from the Pillars Fund and the Whitting Foundation. And then when you slide down, you have um, all of our interviews listed, um, you know, one by one. Right now, as I said, there's 30. And for each interview, you have, um, you know, the video recorded interview, and you have a summary um, that was written in cooperation with library archive interns. Um, you know, after they, um, you know, after they reviewed the transcript and it's, it, you know, it's very, um, painstaking process of writing those, uh, those summaries, making sure they're, they're correct and really represent the, the flavor of the interview. And then we have our keywords list. This is searchable, um, you know, in many different ways, um, the disciplines that are represented from each interview and all of our metadata. And so, um. Another really nice feature of this is that um, um, the slideshow, you know, these are just screenshots from our interviews. And, you know, I like to just go through, um, you know, the, the slideshow and see the diversity of the people, the age diversity, gender diversity. Um, the youngest person we interviewed is just a student and like she just started law school, um, Nabintu Dumbia. And um, the oldest people we interviewed were in their 80s for sure. And um, all kinds of people, naturopathic healers, and um, you know, people who are teaching, uh, you know, the Hajj class, like how to, you know, women teaching classes in, in the mosque and gardeners, master gardeners in the community. I'm just listening, just naming like, you know, people as they pop up so you can really see um, just the richness. And one of the really magical things is that all of the people who are interviewed very often mention each other. And so it's like the keywords, like, you know, of the interviews, they're, they're intersecting and um, it just speaks to, here's a, a master quilt maker whose work is shown in, um, you know, uh, all kinds of um, museums. Here's a, you know, person who founded her own halal business. Um, you know, just, it, the, it's just, you know, uh, a really nice it almost looks like a family album or something <laughs> because people know each other and work have worked together and then i'm almost going to tie up um let me go back to my my slides here um okay and i'm not going to take you through the excruciatingness of going through each of these but this is like a flow chart that kind of shows where we're at and what we've been doing so it all started with the idea for the dream storytelling project that came out of Dream of Detroit. And that idea had been percolating for quite some time um, before I came involved. And I worked to help secure funding uh, with, with Mark. And as soon as that happened, the next step was to assemble our team, keep grant writing, secured a couple of grants, we're finalists in a few more competitions. Um, then the ethnographers are trained. They help us select storytellers. You know, we co conduct our interviews, shoot the footage, and then the part in the third column, which is a little darker blue, is all of the work we do processing the interviews. You know, we learned a lot along the way that transcribing takes many, many hours and a lot of training. People were like, oh, you know, just use a digital or, you know, digital transcription, but it doesn't get all of those, you know, terms that nobody would know, like the name of a street or the name of an organization or the name of people. Um, 
again, video editing is very time consuming as well. Thankfully, we found wonderful people who are doing really good work and helping us process. And then we have the outputs, the archive website, documentary film publications. Uh, we're working with um, a community, all, you know, someone from the uh, the community has uh, Zarina, El um, Zarina um, El Amin, who's a graduate of Western Michigan University, who um, has her MA in anthropology from, you know, Western Michigan University and worked closely with Anne uh, Miles, Professor Anne Miles, who's here now, and perhaps others who might be here. She came through Western and wrote a beautiful book. Um, and then she became a publisher and she has uh, book power publishing. And it's so wonderful that, um, you know, that Western is keeping on working with her. And so some of our stories uh, are being, you know, are have been reworked into essays with the person who gave the interview and included in a book that we have, you know, that we're working on with her called At Their Feet. And um, that's coming out soon too. And there'll be other publications that we'll do in the future. Um, so, and then we have, uh, I think just one more slide. Here's just a chart of how many people we've worked with. So we have just a few administrators, people with film experience from the community, the community-based ethnographers, transcribers, archivists, video editors, others. Um, I imagine that's gonna keep growing. We, I mentioned our supporters of the grants that we have secured, but also we have had five awards from Western Michigan University to fund undergraduates to help us process our data in different ways. University of Michigan, we had two undergraduate awards for, from them for full year student help and a very intensive summer help from University of Michigan. And then also we've had internship partners from all these schools, including of course, Western, Emory, Michigan State, our MSU, University of Illinois, University of Michigan, Wayne State, University of Wisconsin, Madison. And um, yeah, so um, that was what I wanted to present today. And then I would love it if, um, you know, to, if Amy could uh, help fill in a little bit more about the archive aspect of the project and how she first got involved and what that project represents for Western and things like that. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, I guess to back up, if we were looking at the chart that Dr. Perkins just had, I think I probably fall in the other category. Um, I am on the um, advisory board for the Center for the Humanities along with Dr. Perkins. And um, it was, I want to say, probably close to two years ago, uh, maybe longer, that. Uh, I think at the end of one of our meetings, um, Dr. Perkins, you know, kind of mentioned some of this work that she was doing and, um, you know, just looking for ideas of maybe how to present this information. Um, I do a lot of work with digital humanities um, and building digital collections. So um, that was kind of the, the first inkling. Um, and then um, it was, I think, probably about a year ago now after, um, I'm trying to remember when we when we started putting everything together because it's been um, it's it's been a, a process, but I feel like it came together so nicely. It's uh, hard to uh, remember back. Um, but uh, when we started working together again, the um, I was uh, you know I got to hear more about how this project had evolved. Um, I heard about the uh, digital um, the uh, oral histories that were being collected. And that kind of had the, there was this opportunity for uh, the library to engage uh, in being able to partner with um, Dr. Perkins and uh, Mark and Dream of Detroit and you know all these many people that are lending their um, expertise and their labor and their hands and their voices to this project. Uh, and what I thought that we could do was. Uh, serve as a space to preserve and uh, provide access and um, describe these incredible interviews uh, that have been collected uh, by these you know, uh, student ethnographers, which I did see. I think some of them are here today, and it's been uh, really impressive to see the work that's been created and um, it's, uh, you know, I, I feel like the, the project has really flourished from, you know, when I first just heard about it a little bit. 
So I can talk about uh, the repository that we're using. It is our, um, it's our institutional repository at Western. And I like to describe that it's as a place that we capture uh, both the history, but really the um, scholarship and intellectual output of the members of our community uh, of, at Western. So uh, we have started uh, from scratch in that I have not done a streaming oral history video collection before. Uh, we're lucky that we have incredible support from B Press, who runs ScholarWorks. And I was lucky to have such a um, wonderful and involved collaborator in Dr. Perkins that uh, really wanted to know all the ins and outs of working on a digital archive and collection building. So the first thing we did was we kind of, uh, you know, we started looking at what some other examples are and what you know looked good and um it was just a great way like a template to envision this work um you know come to life and be accessible to you know people all over the world so uh we were able to uh kind of land on uh the features that we wanted to include and I was lucky, uh, we were lucky that my colleague, uh, Marianne Swearingo, who is our metadata librarian, um, worked really closely with us to develop a really rich and robust um, metadata, or uh, I, I'll say just a, a way to describe all of the materials for those outside of the library. Um, and it's been really impressive to see the sort of content that is, um, and thought that's going into describing these interviews that are going out there. Um, one of the things uh, that you know I think was really successful is that um, we approached everything in I thought a very like thoughtful and programmatic um, way. In that there was you know a lot of uh, a lot of questions. We spent a lot of time fine tuning workflows and um, you know what we wanted to uh, put out there in the world. So it ended up uh, being a very easy transition from our you know, demo site where we just were tinkering around a little bit to having this uh, full-fledged archive that you know, every time I log in, I'm seeing more and more interviews that's uh, really grown exponentially. So this was really great too in that it offered the opportunity for um, student archivists. Uh, there's been numerous uh, students um, from several different library schools that are interested in the work. And um, this has become, I think, a really great learning experience for them. Um, you know, they are learning about creating these uh, digital archive, uh, working with metadata standards. They're doing, um, you know, an incredible amount of description. Um, and they're, you know, they're learning this collaborative uh, workflow and project management that's just uh, essential to working in the libraries. But also it is, this is a project, um, you know, about public humanities and civic engagement and, uh, you know, strong community ties. Uh, so I think this is also a topic that is something that I think has resonated with these interns and when they go out in the world to start doing, um, you know, other projects like this, it's, I think, a really great backbone to, um, you know, look back on, uh, you know, how their contributions kind of added to the whole. So that has been, that's been ongoing. I believe we've had five different students so far. Um, things, we've been lucky that things have gone very smoothly with the archive. I. Look forward to, uh, you know, keep adding to it. Um, we have the opportunity to add any other um, archival materials that would be interested in telling the story. Um, and one of the great things too about um, putting this in scholar works is that we are able to have these collections harvested by the Digital Public Library of America, which takes this, you know, it provides this. Um, uh, level of access that you know you don't necessarily have at your at your a small institution. So just the idea of people that can you know discover these uh, oral histories and this work and you know learn about this community, um, I think that's been a really valuable 
asthma. So I think uh, I if I don't know if there's much else to say about the library aspect. Um, I would really love to hear um, from our uh, from Mark and uh, Dr. Perkins. Uh, maybe they can tell us a little bit about next steps. I feel like um, you know every time that Dr. Perkins and I talk about this, there is like something new and exciting in the works, and you know some other grant uh, and you know all these up these. Endless opportunities that crop up, so it would be wonderful if you guys wanted to tell us a little more about uh, what we can expect coming up. So, um, lots of good stuff coming up. Um, we have been um, kind of balancing between, you know, collecting interviews and processing the interviews for the oral history, the oral, uh, the archive collection, and then the documentary film, and. Um, so I think we're kind of in a phase now where we're really camping up to um, really start getting into the documentary film more. And um, I think that you're going to see from us um, more work samples like the one I showed and more things like that, which can be posted. And, you know, the film will develop organically over the next like year or so. And so you'll get to see things like the, um, the annual street fair, which couldn't go on because of, of, of COVID, but it's a really unique event. And so I'm glad that, you know, we're hopefully catching up and, you know, going to be in that right, you know, sync it, sync it up with that. So that um, the other thing we're going to, we're going to start seeing from us is the, um, you know, right now we have these, these are these, uh, you know, long, the long form, you know, which are very, very nice for people to be able to really get the context and the full story, but um, the website you know, hopefully what we're going to do with the website is capture, you know, this, these little gems from the, the videos and, you know, we have all these ideas about how we're going to organize the website, how it's going to be thematically oriented. We're going to have a page about education, about the, this really strong tradition of like private education from um, that really started in Detroit with the nation of Islam and went national with, um, you know, Islamic private schools and still goes on today. So our first interview was for, with the director and founder of Al Ikhlas Training Academy, which is a um, beautiful um, Islamic uh, school, parochial school. And it's also a very affordable school. They do a lot of, it's really more like a, in some ways, it's a kind of a charitable and educational program because of the way that they um, they interact with the community and the students. And so, um, another thing I'd like you know to do is partner. You know, hopefully we can partner partner more with them in the future too. And so, um, so we'll have this this website, and perhaps we'll have a page explaining the evolution of that school, and we'll maybe have a page about women entrepreneurs who do things um, relating to the Muslim community. Uh, and we'll have like leaders and we'll have these little um, small gems that you can click on and quickly get to the, you know, the meat of a story. And um, the publication will be out soon and our grant writing is, is ongoing and intensive and, um, you know, we've, we've, we've been well received and hopefully, you know, we will continue to be. And so, um, you know, uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is that websites are by nature kind of ephemeral. And so um, I have been very intensively talking with Amy about how when we do get our website up, how can we preserve it, you know, and not make it ephemeral. And that's something that hopefully we can continue to work together on. Um, hopefully we'll get more young people involved in different ways. And um, that's what that's what I feel like will happen. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have a, a ton to add to that. I'm I'm really excited for the the rest of the project to plan out. I, you know, when we first started to even write the first grant, I don't think you know either of us knew this was going to turn into a three year project. <laughs> but it's been it's been really great to see it like really take on this life. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is an important sort of ramping up period for Dream as well as we start to staff up in more significant ways and and try to really figure out. You know, what does the future of this organization look like, you know, as we get out of this, uh, uh, as we go from zero to one, really, and as we start to think about, you know, what does a five year, 10 year, 20 year strategic plan look like? So, uh, just in the coming months, as we, as we sort of start to open up a little bit more, um, uh, you know, we'll be doing more community organizing workshop. We'll get back to our movie nights and discussions, which in the past have generated really rich conversations with the community about 
you know, what does it mean to be black in Detroit in the 2000s, you know, in the era of water shutoffs and mass foreclosures, you know, we've looked at issues like redlining in other cities and how does that relate to the narrative in Detroit as well. And, you know, we often try to do these sort of uh, popular education type of events where we can bring folks together to learn from one another. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're moving into the, our community land trust establishment, so we'll be transferring a lot of the parcels that we own into that, as well as trying to really suss out, like, can we do new construction in a neighborhood like this? Detroit has historically been saddled with, um, you know, this issue of developers really abandoning the city, and not just not just walking away, but like violently walking away, you know, being a being a, an integral part of the white flight of the city. Uh, and then refusing to actually build and develop in the city. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, can we do new construction in a, in a neighborhood like this? Can we go beyond just preserving, you know, the vacant houses that we've been able to salvage? Um, and we just actually earlier this week purchased our first uh, commercial parcel uh, on that strip of, of Woodrow Wilson Street that we talked about. So we had to launch a 48 hour fundraising campaign to come up with the money when this property became available. Uh, and thankfully, you know, the community stepped up in big ways and we were able to secure it. So, um, you know, we're excited about the next few months and, and really hoping that a lot of this, you know, can be captured by our videographers for our documentary, especially. Um, and then I'll just say it's been so great watching the young folks who are involved in this project. So I, I haven't, you know, sat in on a ton of the interviews yet or anything, but I had a chance to come to one of their videography trainings this summer or two of them actually. And, uh, you know, just watching, you know, how intent they were with the project, how serious they were about learning these skills and applying them, um, getting to see some of the interview skills that, that, that they already honed, as Dr. Perkins said, uh, you know, it's just been really, really great having them as a part of this project. Thank you. Uh, so I am monitoring the chat and we have a question uh, from our colleague, Dr. Miles. She says, as you listen to and collect the life histories, which I'm sure can stand on their own, are you thinking about what the stories tell in terms of history slash culture? That is the larger picture of a community in flux, et cetera. And if these ideas are emerging, how do you intend to disseminate this more wide angle view? Yeah, what that, I mean, what an excellent question. I think that, um, the more wide angle view is the atomistic view of each life history interview is what is the archive is for. And so that's like, you know, pieces, right? And then someone else can put together another researcher, you know, can come in and put together the puzzle, you know? Um, so just, uh, I'll answer the question in a second, but I've been thinking about how, like, you know, let's say some of our young community based ethnographers, you know, when they're in college and they have to do like an, um, you know, um, some kind of paper or investigation, they can dip into the archive and they can, you know, write a paper that's informed by interviews that they were part of. And there's really precious little, uh, little uh, information. There's some really good books, especially like um, some recent books by um, Professor Sally Howell and some others in Detroit um, that talk more historically about it. But there's really a surprising lack of, of information about like ethnographic information. And so, you know, other scholars, and um, students and all kinds of people will be able to go in and even journalists, you know, who want to, let's say, like, there's a journalist who wants to write about another article, <laughs> maybe about Dream of Detroit, and they could go in and they could actually, like, get a lot of background information before they, you know, interview some people. There's so many ways it can be used. So that's like the raw, you know, there's like a raw quality to it because we didn't want to, you know, when we edit, we do the video editing, we try very hard. Um, to leave in every single piece of substantive information, and even sometimes the interchanges between the um, the oral the, the storytellers and the the students who may be um, you know a great a great nephew or um, you know an aunt and like oh remember that time this or that happened and so that quality of um, you know not being analyzed and made into something else is why the archive is so important. The website will begin to do what um, Dr. Miles is talking about because we will have um, for each of the pages, we will have a story being told. We will have a way of, you know, what I'm envisioning is first, and we've started already extracting, I like to call it like extracting these gems from these interviews. And then they'll, let's say like one really exciting theme we have is women entrepreneurs, like women who have um, started food businesses uh, and have started all kinds of like, you know, a naturopath and women who, um, 
you know, have their own, like, this thing called the social loft, which is a gender segregated, segregated space. We have all kinds of business women that we want to keep, um, you know, people who are fashion designers and, um, you know, cosmetologists, uh, natural cosmetologists and, um, to, and, and daycare. Um, there's so many, I'm, I'm not remembering them all. And so by kind of like, you know, if we have like, let's say seven of these women and we have little extracts from each, then we can kind of create this story about how from the beginning, from the 30s, Nation of Islam has always been very much into, you know, black owned businesses and businesses serving the community and finding a way of, you know, creating community through this kind of thing. And here's how these women are now contributing to that legacy self consciously a lot of the time also like realizing that they are doing this very deliberately, very intentionally. I feel like people from the community that we're interviewing are very, very well versed in this history themselves and um, are very. Uh, likely to make those connections and, you know, what we have to do is just draw a thread through them and then say, you know, this is what this set of interviews, this is how this set of interviews is interfering and that will be a kind of analytic process. And so what I'm hoping when we get there is that there'll be, you know, that there'll be kind of a few different people from the community who we draft that kind of material with. It will be a collaborative way of, of drafting. Um, and then, of course, the documentary film is all about, you know, um, that very uh, digested, um, you know, analytical aspect when we have the filmmaker who is, you know, the filmmakers, we have Malika Shabazz and um, Shikab Ahmed and other filmmakers who will be, um, you know, having to, you know, get informed by the, the backlog, the backlog of information we did and then make all these choices. And of course, filmmakers tell stories in a very different way than anthropologists do. Um, but there's, and it's almost like easy to forget the constructed nature of it, you know, because it looks like, oh, that's what you see is what you get. But there's a lot of uh, deliberate um, storytelling and digestion of, of there. Um, but, uh, you know, as collaborative and we'll have the, you know, the, the general readership publications, I'm not sure what else we'll have, um, you know, with the general readership publication, we still have that atomistic quality of essay and essay, you know, different essays. So in terms of a more analytic whole, um, not we don't have an exact output like that in mind yet of a community based, um, you know, but maybe there will be, um, we'll have, um, you know, there'll also be like a teaching guide, hopefully for, to go with the film that'll give some background. So there'll be these more digested qualities, but in terms of taking all this material and really creating um, a store, like creating like a, basically like a scholarly kind of thing, I think others will take up that that task and use our materials to do that. But. Uh, as always, Anne, thank you for such a productive question, <laughs> Dr. Ann Miles. If anybody else has questions, um, you know, please feel free to enter them into the chat. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also just jump in to say how how grateful I am that we can host the the archive on ScholarWorks. I mean, you know, we had talked about you know a website, of course, but you know, I. I when I was younger, I used to make websites for folks, so I can personally attest to how quickly they become stale and, and unmaintained, and eventually they just become a white page that says 503 Gateway here. <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm very grateful that like all the work that, that have gone into these is being uh, so expertly preserved. That's been, um, yeah, as you know, we keep talking about, you know, these websites are just so ephemeral, but this, you know, this is the real kind of, you know, meat of it all where, you know, you're going to have these histories and, you know, we have uh, committed to stewarding them um, for, you know, as long as the library exists. Um, but, you know, and going back to um, what Elisa just said, you know, kind of, you know, these uh, maybe thematic ways to, um, you know, bring all this information together in this website. I'm really excited to see where that goes, um, you know, it would be interesting that, you know, different interpretations or themes that people, you know, come up with when, um, you know, kind of the community comes together to, uh, to, you know, kind of look through things. I really enjoy the, um, you know, this uh, intergenerational aspect too, um, just to see what the students are doing. And then, um, you know, to see these uh, community elders, I feel like this is, um, I feel like these are relationships that are oftentimes really um, lost in modern day um, America. So, um, you know, that's been, uh, as I've been working on this and loading things, you know, that's something that I've really keyed into. And I would love to see how this sort of um, work could, uh, you know, the students that are doing this, like what kind of, um, 
you know, framework of this could be to inspire other students to go out into their communities and, you know, do something similar. So I feel like there's just uh, so many areas that can be um, touched by the work that is being done here. Yeah, I really hope that, that we can, yeah, continue to tell the, the story of the students' involvement. I, I have to confess to, like, Dream not having the best like social media game in the world. Like we haven't been giving you know the behind the scenes photos and everything along the way throughout the project as thoroughly as we as we should have or as I wish we had. But you know uh, there's there's definitely plenty that's been captured there. Um, you know, and to the multi generational aspect, you know, there's a saying in our tradition that um, that you know he or she who is not kind, who is not respectful of the elder or kind to the to the young person is, is not one of us. And so, you know, to be able to like honor and really respect our elders by capturing these histories and also, you know, offer this this service and this training to the young folks who are who you know are benefiting from this in, in real ways, um, you know, it just feels great. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Today I will mention um, that uh, Dr. Perkins and um, I hope Mark, if you're able to, they will be joining us for the final um, discussion uh, that uh, to kind of cap off this um, uh, this series. Um, I do have another um, comment that I can read uh, from our one of our colleagues, um, Dr. Todd Pitka. Um, then he says, "Sorry, I don't have a specific question." but just wanted to let you all know how impressive this project is. Really great stuff. Thanks for showing it off to us. Um, I'm thankful that you said that too, Todd, because one of the things I was thinking about, um, you know, when you were talking, Mark, is that, uh, you know, the world in many ways has kind of uh, come to a stop, but the work at Dream of Detroit and this project has, you know, found a way and, you know, has kept going. You know, I feel like so many projects have been derailed or just kind of put on the back burner. Um, but this just, you know, keep forge it keeps forging ahead. New opportunities are discovered, new contents created. Um, and that's been something really refreshing to see when we're very much in a holding pattern a lot these days. So. Thanks. Um, and then also, um, uh, Dean Koretsky says, uh, agreed, thank you for all this excellent work. And um, I'm, I hope I don't mispronounce your name. Um, Adib Mosa says, I totally agree with Todd. This is a groundbreaking way of research and community partnership. Great job. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, you know, before I uh, went off on the tangent about uh, COVID, I just, I did wanna say, uh, Mark and Elisa will be back, um, and uh, we hope to have kind of a, a nice discussion with our other, other panelists who've been engaged in digital storytelling and these community-based um, participatory research projects, and um, you know, being able to tap into the expertise of all these uh, wonderful scholars and activists, I think, will be um, uh, really helpful to uh, a lot of us wanting to do kind of similar work and get out in our community and capture histories and, um, you know, make a difference. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you next week. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic work. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Great, you guys got uh, there were many nice compliments in the in the chat. So well done. Thank you so much. Really impressive. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember when you first told me about it, Elisa, and it was um I mean it was a while ago and I feel like it was just the very beginning. And you're like, I feel like there could be some sort of, you know, did because I I Always be <laughs> for digital right. humanities. It's like there could be something there. So to see last what year now has been has been great. Thank you. This is really nice. Thanks for joining. So glad we did this. Thank you so much. Great, great job. We'll Thank see you, you guys next week. Thanks. And so nice meeting you, Mark. Nice Thanks to meet you. Likewise. Thank you both. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.